Patrick clicked in to College Volleyball Weekly on Viral Volley Media. Now here's your host, Rob on Mike. All right, good day everyone. Episode four of College Volleyball Weekly. And we had a, uh, we'll say a party crasher. He took out Jay Hosick and decided to step in. That would be Mark Pavlik or The Pav. That's his stage name at Penn State University. Brad Ross Stratter at UC San Diego. Theo Edwards of Cal State Northridge. And Dan Friend of Lewis. Back from the Oprah week, which we we're so excited for him because uh, I feel like we, were, we were camping on him last, in last episode. So um, guys, you know, there was a lot of volleyball this last week, and there's some surprise results, and there were some expected results and change of lineups for top teams that are traveling the uh, East Coast. But I want to get your take on it. We'll start with our newbie or our Jay Hosick, uh, who's uh, got him now falsely imprisoned somewhere in the office there. Uh, we'll go with Mark Pav. Yeah, I, I never replaced Jay. We, we know the only thing that really knocks Jay out is Steph. So <laughs> I imagine she threw a few good haymakers here this week so he's recovering from that um i you know personally speaking we're in the middle of a, of a murderer's row or as some people point out to me the typical mpsf uh, old mpsf schedule uh, and uh, had a great match here on wednesday with alan and andy and nick and matt's team in the 40 uh, i guess i can't call them the 49ers the beach anymore and um it was uh it was everything you'd expect in January uh, between the two teams. I think if you go back, there have been more of our matches that have gone five in the last, I don't know, six, seven years. And uh, it, was, it was one of those matches where he who streaked last won. Uh, reminds me of a lot of the matches we've had with Dan recently. Uh, it just seems like no lead was safe and uh, it, it was it was as physical a match as I've been in in January for a long, long time. Now, your guys I mean, got that. Hey, hey, Robert, Pav, let me ask this. I didn't get to watch the live match. Did anything surprise you in the match? I mean, you kind of knew what you were going to get with your guys and but seeing Long Beach live or anything. I think um, we know they got a couple of different pieces, but uh, or everything you kind of knew going into it. No, I think you know, the one thing that I thought, I thought Aiden Knight is continuing to improve. I thought he did a real nice job for them. Um, you know, I think they're they're getting the balls to the middles a little bit more. Um, it was it was really just a, a battle of, I think, two physical teams. I mean, serves were, were being fought off instead of passed, and that, that, was, that was fun to be part of. Well, you... Uh... You guys took the first set as a do set, but I mean, your guys are coming off a pretty great offensive production week and defensive with Mikhail Koval and um, John Kerr and Bogner's been playing some great ball. He had Wildman back. I mean, you guys were looking strong. I was like out of the game, like, wow, Penn State came out of the Austin weekend and are playing Long Beach State and you had good momentum in there. Um, you, had to, you had some good takeaways from that match, though. Yeah, we, and we carried that through game one. I think it was a matter of Long Beach, you know, kind of getting its competitive legs. They were down at uh, Mason the weekend that we were with you in, in Austin, and they bust up State College on Sunday and uh, trained up here for Monday, Tuesday, played them Wednesday, and we jumped out, I, I want to say 25-18. I think we had 565 in game one. And it's, uh, we're, we're switching sides thinking – and nobody hits 565 with regularity against Long Beach. So we knew they were going to answer the bell. And, and they did. And the last three games were all deuce games. So, yes. uh, yeah, it, it's just it's in the middle of a of a great stretch run. And I think for all of us, with, with really the reduction in size of conferences that have taken place over the last four to five years, it's opening up more and more dates for us. Unfortunately, most of the dates have got to be condensed into January. Uh, but I think we're all making the effort to try to get out and play uh, more intra-conference games than, than in my career I can ever remember everybody playing. And I, I think that's a good thing for men's volleyball. I think that's something that, um, you know, teams that maybe have not had certain higher level teams in their gyms get a chance to see them and 
feel what it's like to play against them and all of a sudden have a bar that says, hey, if we want to compete, here's where we've got to be. So I think just doing all of that, uh, it, it, we're going to see uh, a benefit occur hopefully over the next four or five years where we're going to see, if you will, um, the bottom start to raise. And, and I think that's going to be a great thing for men's volleyball. I figured we'd extend a little bit here because this is one of the topics we're going to talk about in our upcoming big topics after we talk about results. But, you know, usually it was, it's been uh, Satiris Sapanis and Spencer Olivier carrying the load for the beach. But this time Clark Godbold steps up 17 kills. And, you know, I think one of the most undercover weapons from the service line has been Simon Torway. The, I want to call him the Spaniard, but he's German because Spaniard sounds way cool from gladiator, but he has a tough serve, and he's been a situational server where he just bombs. But can you speak a little bit about that in that matchup? Yeah, I, I think you know he was he was struggling a little bit with his top spin, and he went to a float that put us in trouble. And um, you know, I think that that was part of what kind of settled the, the match down for them. Um, and right, Spanis and, and Olivier just behind the line. You got to get them off the line. And if you if you are fortunate enough to be in a good pass situation, I'm not even talking perfect, but good pass, you you got to work real hard to make sure they don't have a second attempt to get rolling on their service on their serving. Yep, guys, want to ask anything else to Pav or have anything else to add about that Long Beach State at a Penn State matchup? No, I put it on on the hot seat long enough, so we're good. Yeah, but, but Brad wants to keep the heat on though. Yeah, yeah, we got a little bit, you know, or else Taylor would be disappointed in me. <laughs> but I, I thought just like just looking at the stats and from the bits I piece I saw, like Sapanis did not have a typical night for himself. And the fact they were still able to win without a productive member just speaks to their team and like the balance that they have within their offense out of the middles and from Godbold on the right. It was it was impressive. Yeah, yeah you know, I think you just you go in, we held them to under. 300 they held us to under 300 you know brett's just wildman's just coming back and uh that was his his really third third match where he's finally getting his feet underneath him he didn't have a great night but i think that's in january you got to figure out ways to win right yeah, that's that's the way it, it kind of always bleeds out as far as i've found it and, um, no doubt the beach will figure that out and they'll be stronger if we get a chance to see them a second time this year. And hopefully we will be too. But just like all of us, I think we're just still trying to figure out uh, some things. And, you know, this going into what the fifth weekend of play now, things are starting to get a little bit more solidified, I think, in each of our gyms. That's scary. You're saying Long Beach is going to figure it out. like they're five and oh, with some quality wins under their belt. <laughs> Theo, do you have anything to add? I feel like you're gonna. Like, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think the the most important piece, right? We always talk about talent, um, and both these teams are incredibly talented, and obviously, it's exciting to watch this kind of volleyball in January. But then you got to remember, right? Long the most the probably the most important thing in January is experience, and this Long Beach team is incredibly experienced, and uh, you know, obviously, the Ohio State transfer didn't have the match that that you know Brad was talking about wasn't as good as you know. He typically is, but the rest of that roster for Long Beach is, is pretty much identical to last year. And um, they saw themselves obviously in some really, really big matches and have a ton of experience playing together. And, you know, I think that that really weighs dividends in January when, uh, when we haven't been playing all that much ball and maybe don't have everything kind of firing on all cylinders. And, you know, to, to Pad's defense, he's got some guys that have been banged up and the roster has changed a bit and, um, you know, it takes a little time to get that thing rolling. And uh, I thought that Long Beach uh, might have met them at the right time. And, uh, you know, it ended up working out in their favor. Yep. All right. Anyone else? I think uh, let's jump over to let's go West Coast way. We'll go to uh, Brad. Any other matches uh, results that caught your eye during week four? Yeah, I mean, I think the Irvine BYU matchup was super intriguing. You know, we'll touch on it a little bit more, but just to see Irvine really be pretty much in control night one consistently with Sonny, Heno, Gillis, just holding it down on the pins um, to seeing the tweaks and adjustments that Sean Olmstead was able to make at BYU um, to frustrate Sonny, to frustrate Heno and slow those guys down. And I, I don't 
know the numbers exactly, but I know they they had quite a few blocks in that match. As Rob, you know better than all of us. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, and it was just impressive <laughs> performance and impressive adjustments. And it just goes to show, like, as the, the season goes on, and the coaches will be able to make some tweaks, adjustments to kind of help help their teams be in a better position for success. So, so that was a fun matchup to see the back-to-back. Well, the volley nerd in me wants to bounce this off you coaches because got to talk to Sean Olmstead on night one and then on night two. But I love seeing, like, he comes out of the, the night one loss, a 3-0 loss, makes the, uh, the adjustment, and he basically made one flip uh, pre-match, and that was moving uh, Romanis to OH1 because he started in OH2 in night one. And then, <clears throat> you know, and, and they're still giving Irvine a fight in night two in an intense way. It was like back to back to back. And then uh, he makes takes Capoto Brown out for his freshman, Anthony Scherfon, and he makes immediate offensive contributions and gets blocks. Um, but it is Tion Taylor, and this is the number that kills me. The previous high this season in blocks for any individual or for a team was 16.5. BYU had 22 on us on uh, Friday uh, Friday night. So, uh, and it was amazing to see how their block adjusted. And um, BYU is a big physical team. You know, they're they all look they're all small, but they're all six seven plus. So when they're all six seven plus, everyone looks short except for Worthington. The uh, five, nine Libro. So, um, you know, it was, I love seeing that adjustment and watch it work out through the match and commentating on it with Charlie. Um, but I want to get your guys take. It's like, it's such this chess game when you have very similar talent on both sides of the court, but those little tweaks make the biggest difference because one or two or two points wins the set. So, but I want to get your guys take and, you know, being that your guys with the clipboards and looking at all the data metrics and all that stuff. So uh, let, let's, uh, whoever feels like I want to jump in, please do. Well, I'm not surprised with BYU. I mean, BYU is always a really skilled blocking team, one of the places that teach it the best. So I'm not surprised they made a few adjustments and with a few pieces and put them in a position to do that. The night we played them at their place, they're, they're touching everything. So they're they're putting their uh, guys in good spots, making good reads, especially in medium system. And so, you know, if they're putting you in medium system, they're they're at an advantage, I think, sometimes with what they can do to you. So. All right. Uh, let's, uh, anyone else have anything to add on to that or you want to jump on to Theo? Good. All right. Theo. Yeah, I think, right. uh, I think the Ohio state and, and, uh, Princeton matchup was really good. Um, and obviously those two teams are, are teams that are trying to figure some things out and, um, uh, trying to play some consistent ball and, you know, obviously seeing Ben Harrington, man, he, uh, had a hell of a night, huh? 20 kills, 459. Um, <laughs> yeah was just an absolute force and I had an opportunity to watch a little bit of it. And uh, he, he did a tremendous job, played incredibly well. And uh, so super exciting match. And, you know, anytime you go five, it's always, it's always fun, right? It would have been nice if that fifth one was a little bit closer, but uh, I thought that was an exciting match for the week. Yep. All right, Dan, chip in. How about yours? Let's throw out a couple, like we got North Greenville who beat St. Francis. Uh, And so I thought that was uh pretty good win for North Greenville. Uh, and then I think there was uh, the De La Cruz kid there was pretty good. You know what I mean? So with them, so in terms of that. And then the one I want to bring up is Isaiah Fed at Fort Valley State. Um, ultimately, 33 kills. They lost the match, but it went five with King. And so uh, hit 545. So I think uh, pretty great to see from uh, from uh, that squad that they've got some young talent that's trying to figure some of those things out a little bit in terms of that. So uh, that was pretty good. So, um, and then our own conference, I think McKendry went and beat Harvard and St. Francis. So I think McKendry's <laughs> kind of flying under the radar a little bit and they've got some good young talent. And so, uh, I think you're going to see them kind of poised to be in a good spot with conference play and, uh, doing some nice things. And, uh, uh but yeah, few. So. Yeah. The, uh, one of the teams that you'd mentioned there, McKendry, you know, I was watching those results as I was working the match. I'm like, Wow, they're they're really sneaking up on people. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see what shapes up in the in the MIVA there for you, Dan. Yeah. And um, yeah, but but also, I, I might tell our listeners about like you were talking about this. Like if they're wanting scores, like maybe plug in that NCA scores uh, link that uh, you can kind of look up all the matches that we all talked about a little bit, which is good. So yeah, I'll throw it up on the uh, as a graphic or something on our screen after we uh, post production and uh, throw it up on social. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Uh, with that, you know, with some of the topics, there's some of the teams that we haven't discussed that are at the top. And I'm sorry, Theo, but got to talk about UCLA. 
You and should. he had firsthand experience as Brad did a few weeks ago. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> yeah, that match was uh was was a good one for us. Um, I think it helped us learn a ton about ourselves. And you know, unfortunately, we played two matches this week. First one was against USC. Um, ended up going four and did not play particularly well. Um, ended up losing to them and. And then we, you know, it got a little bit better and we played uh, UCLA on Friday and UCLA played great. Um, they, uh, I think one of the biggest things, and, and I think Brad can can attest to this, their serving pressure is probably the best that we've seen all year. Um, and maybe one of the better that I've seen across the country. They protect the ball incredibly well. Um, Ito went to the end line and uh, he rattled off three, four, five really elite serves in a row. Um, and made it incredibly difficult for our serve receive. And uh, I actually thought our guys responded pretty well. We hit almost 400. I think we ended up hitting like 360 on the match and um, played pretty well, but not enough to win, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the third set was pretty close. I think it was Deuce. We ended up, I think we were up 23-20 and just couldn't find a way to close it out. And we set our guys and we ran the plays that we you know, thought would help us win. And unfortunately, UCLA, you got to tip my hat, they, they made some great plays. and and uh were able to stop us and and they beat us man it was it was a good match for us but unfortunate we would love to come out on the other end of that <laughs> good stuff anyone else uh, want to add anything about ucla and what they've just observed this week yeah well, they... I, I, I was thinking more about theo's son's modeling career as he was talking in that conversation so i apologize <laughs> yeah. i'm surprised he doesn't have a tilly's banner in back of his uh <laughs> office yeah <there. laughs> NIL oh, deal. <laughs> Duke is right in Edwards family, uh, for sure. Can we get some of your with, jeans on us? UCLA, um, the interesting piece is, you know, David is just getting back and getting rolling. Um, you know, when we played them out at Poly, he did not serve great. And then seeing him serve a little bit better against Northridge, he's just getting back in the flow of being healthy and, and playing full time. And that just adds an extra element to what they can do to their already very deep roster. Yep. Pat, don't you get them next week? Yep, we have USC, UCLA, and Ohio State here for the Big Ten Pac-12 Challenge. So yeah. Pat's over there scribbling notes, guys. So keep talking. He needs to <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like big serve. Oh my god! <laughs> It'll be on YouTube, and you can listen to it again. <laughs> Great defense. Oh my god! <laughs> so. Oh. I think, uh, Brad, you're going to add any, something else? or uh, No, that was it. That was it, yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about one of the teams that is still undefeated that's outside the top 15, and it's in the EIVA, Charleston. Uh, Pat, you want to take a, a, a whack at it and see uh, what you can break down there? Yeah, we we don't see them until the, the last weekend of the regular season. So by that time, we'll have a, we'll have a ton of info on them, but – I know Luke is, uh, I think he's gotten, um, I want to say another Australian in, and he's just taken some kids that have been there that I think has, has, has kind of suffered from just, you know, three coaches, three years, just stunted some of the, the development. And I think he's been able to um, move their development into an area that, hey, everybody is now doing what they thought they could do. Um, I just, I think the EIVA is going to be an interesting league this year because, you know, Jay just went five with New Jersey Tech and um, you got Luke that's really putting it to everybody that they face that if you look in the past, I don't think Charleston's ever done what they've done in January this year. So um, I, it's going to be interesting. I, you know, they've got some talent in the middle, uh, their setters back again at you know, three time, at least a three year starter. I think it was all the IBA, if not last year, the year before. So I think Luke's putting the pieces together, and, and I think uh, the guys are his guys are starting to figure out hey, this is what we need to do to be successful. It'll be an interesting run for them. Yeah. Anyone else anything to add about Charleston? No, I just I, I looked at their schedule. I don't see anybody beating them until they get to conference play. Um, like they've got. Um, Harvard, they open up at Harvard on conference play, and I think they got a few matches that they're going to they're going to be undefeated when they walk in the EVA play to start off with uh, in terms of that. So, um, which will be a pretty good confidence boost, I think, as they start conference play from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think Pat's right. I think 
Eva fellow team members better watch out when they get in the conference play. With them. <laughs> so. Well, I got to tell you what, I don't feel bad for anyone in the IVA. Uh, this is, this is exactly what men's volleyball is and what it's becoming. And, you know, obviously for, for us over here in the big West and, and all the teams in MPSF, I mean, it's, the competition is, is pretty impressive and it makes it incredibly difficult to play anything, but your starting string, unless you've got the depth like UCLA, but um, you know, I, it's exciting. And I think for the, for the fans that are listening, I mean, the EIVA is going to be an exciting league to watch. And I think every match you're going to see a lot of, there's going to be a lot of upsets and there's going to be a lot of uh, close ones. And, and, you know, I think that's, that's the best part about volleyball and uh, there's the reason we play it, right. You got to see who wins. So the, I'm excited you, for the IVA for sure. And, and don't you think that speaks to what's going on at the grassroots level with boys anymore? I mean, there are so many kids out there that, that you look at, whether they're 16, 17, you know, all of a sudden, 18 months later, they've gone through a growth spurt. They're two inches taller. They're 15 pounds heavier. And they're out there. They're, no more do you just put a ball and play and watch the popcorn popper exist on the other side of the net. Every team has big boys that can take swings at balls. And it just seems to me that those that believe in their physicality the longest are generally in the best position to win a game. Yeah, we played St. Francis, Brooklyn, and Maryville, and, you know, both fairly new programs, and I walked into St. Francis, Brooklyn, and I'm like, wow, these guys, they've got some size, they've got some physicality, they're they're doing some nice things, and even Maryville, second-year program, they've got some kids already, and 6'8", six, 6'9", six, and it's just like, uh, but I think we could all say that, like, I can't, I, I have a pretty big roster compared to, to some teams, and, like, we're turning away kids every year, like, a lot of rosters are big and they can't take any more kids rosters that can't have more kids. I know Pat would take more if he could do you know what I mean, but he just can't do you know what I mean? So it's like, right. there's not enough places for these kids to play. So these programs that, you know, might be up and coming, you're going to see that talent trickle into those places. And which is, I just think, think great for the overall game. Yeah. yeah you, I mean, see, you see like, just like the expansion of the game and there's every year, there's more players that can play in your gym, you know, and it's just finding those perfect fits and the guys exactly. We know, are going to help upgrade our gym or be able to develop in our system um, because you have the volleyball and they're coming from all over. Right. And even look at Charleston, they have a setter from Florida, a junior college opposite. They have two international outside hitters. It's, it's not just coming up through the grassroots. They're coming from international. They're coming from all different walks of life. They're coming from different sports. Um, it just enriches the volleyball culture and community that we got growing. I got an email from a guy that was a trampoline champion yesterday. <laughs> I mean, this guy's six eight, doing like a hundred flips on a trampoline. It was amazing. You know, I think we need to take that into like volleyball slam ball and <laughs> yeah. a new sport here. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I think you got to add too. I think it's a testament to the coaching, right? And I think that there's been a tremendous growth of the of the game and the knowledge of where coaches can learn how to teach this game. Um, you know. There was a there was a time, and I know you guys can remember this, where if you weren't playing volleyball in some of the biggest hubs, the odds of getting the right training um, and coming in ready to play at the, at the highest level was incredibly rare. Um, and so we, I know Dan Friend has has been successful bringing in a lot of you know basketball type kids and kids that maybe didn't have a ton of training, and now we're starting to see that a lot of these kids are being forced to play one sport early. Um, but are still able to get quality training um, across the country. And, you know, there's a lot of different programs like USA Volleyball that are that are helping teach coaches and, and give them some fundamentals and some basis on how to how to coach these kids. And I think it's really helping with the growth of the game. And now I would just love to see more scholarships, more scholarship opportunities and, you know, the ability to to get these kids an opportunity to play and play at a high level and hopefully have their school paid for at some point. Yep. Anything else, gentlemen? Good. Good. All right. Well, let, we've talked about the other conferences, but we've kind of skipped out on the MIVA because there is a someone who's rising up and is still undefeated. And I know that the coach played in this coach's golf tournament this last summer. That would be John Hawks at Loyola. 
in the Miva at seven and zero this season, or is it six? I, I may have jumped a little forward there, but still undefeated and uh, you know, great turnaround from last year or they're doing pretty all, all right last year too. But I mean, they are playing really well. Uh, anyone want to comment on what they're doing so far this season? Uh, well, actually we'll start with Dan and then we'll, we'll, we'll take in chatter from the other guys. Yeah. I mean, they're good. They've got uh, Parker Van Buren on the opposite. They got Cole on the outside. They got a new setter plugged in and John and his staff have done a nice time of implementing their system with these guys. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, they're playing some good volleyball. We saw them in the fall. Uh, they've taken care of the matches they should have taken care of uh, in terms of the ones that have been in front of them so far. And uh, I mean, ultimately, they finished second in league last year. They were going to win league at towards the end, and they dropped the match to Ohio State at home and then were really poised to host everything. So I think it was just a couple unfortunate matches towards the end last year, but they were really good last year. And so no surprise to me whatsoever. Hawks yep. is super talented, and he went in there and – they're not skipping a beat and probably even gotten better with some things. And so, and uh, I think they will have a couple of challenging matches uh, as they move forward. I think they might have Long Beach, I think, coming up yeah. uh, this weekend. And so before yep. conference play kind of opens up. And so, uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, good group. And uh, certainly looking forward to playing somewhere late February for us. So, yeah. All right. The rest of the coaching staff thoughts on the undefeated Loyola Ramblers. Yeah, we got to see it firsthand out there in Chicago when we got to see Loyola and Dan, but they just are playing some good, clean volleyball, which is not always the case early on in the year and seeing it all come together. And Dan Mangum, their setter, has done a really good job kind of connecting with Parker Van Buren and, and really maximizing him in the front row and the back row and, and all over and and they have three good left sides with Schlottauer, who's been their guy, but they have a couple other left sides that they've been rotating in uh, as well that it's kind of a second outside hitter by committee sometimes and, and seeing it all come together and Hawks has them playing great and playing hard. Um, it's really fun to watch um, and see, and I'm excited to see them. They got Concordia and Long Beach out here in California, so it'll be fun to see how they do with the back-to-back -back of two tough matches. Yeah. Hey, yeah, coaches, Pat for Theo. You good? All right. Well, you know, we're going to do this, call this the uh, in memory of Dave Hunt segment because we're going to look at the MPSF team. <laughs> yes, if you didn't know, Dave Hunt is at Texas, left the men's side and got a natty, and it's like, you know, showing up. And yeah, horns up. There you go. Congrats to him. But, you know, there's a, another good team in the MPSF, and that'd be Grand Canyon, who's got a program high 7 0 start or program best 7 0 start. And that's without Camden Gianni, which is one of our topics. And he actually came back and played this weekend. But that's what Matt Mer Worley, the former best-looking coach of the MIVA, is doing <laughs> in the MPSF. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, any guys want to chime in since we don't have an MPSF coach on here? Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, essentially 12 hours ago, we were just in their gym um, battling them and, and getting to go up against them. And it was, it was cool to see. And Matt does a great job with them. Um, we've talked about a little bit. Jay spoke really highly of Nick Slight, their setter, and he's doing a really good job. Uh, Rico Wardlow in the middle, the, the Miva transfer, has been really helping them. But those left sides, Hickman, um, Janky, and Jonah, uh, I forget his last name, but Jonah has been really good uh, on the right side for him all year and continues to develop. And they've played Gianni the last third set against Erskine on Friday and the third set against us yesterday. Um, and he he's looking good. He's you can tell he's not quite where he's been, but he's going to be just fine. And it's going to really help them in the MPSF play, being able to add in an outside hitter. And they're going to have three outside hitters in a libero and serve receive against some tough serving teams. And that's going to help keep them in system a little bit more and, and allow them to manage some heat from some of those better serving teams. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? No, yeah, I think I'll, Hickman's I'll been a pretty good plug for those guys. I mean, Hickman was playing those matches, and so. He's a former Lewis guy. He's a big fan of his. So it's good to see him having success, success with uh, Gianna kind of out of the lineup a little bit there. So Yeah. Theo, did you had something to add there? Yeah, I just think, you know, again, the the Gianni is, is a big piece to this, right? I think that team's obviously already playing great and is capable of winning matches without him. Um, now with him kind of easing his way back, I think he only played one set, if I'm if I'm wrong, right, Brad, in that match against you guys? Third set, yeah. He Third played. set. Yeah, and so having him back and and obviously inching him back in slowly gives them a little bit more depth and and allows them to do some more things in terms of can, is he on the right, is he on the left, how do you work it, and 
and uh, and what do you do? And obviously, I think Matt is going to do a fantastic job with those decisions. And but that team is an absolute weapon. I think they're going to be a force, and we'll probably see them down the stretch for sure. Yeah, they have a gnarly stretch coming up. Uh, it kicked off with three matches in uh, two matches in three days, and then I think they have eight matches over the next twelve days or something like that. So they have quite a few matches coming up here. So if they make it out through that, that depth is going to be needed. And um, they're, they're plenty formidable. They'll, they'll be in the mix. Yep. Any team that can make it through an NHL playoff series. <laughs> 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 All right. Hey, so uh, with that, we are going to look at what's going on around the, the uh, NCAA. But we looked at the top 15 and at the end of yesterday, only five teams remain undefeated, which is phenomenal. And they're, they're strong teams worthy of the record. But if you bump that out to teams with one loss, that's still 10 teams with only one loss. I mean, the competition is insane. So I wanted to get your guys' comments on what we're seeing early on here, only four weeks in. So let's start with you, Pat. Oh, I, I, again, I think it's you're, you're seeing more interconference play. Um, you're seeing, like, I think Brad... Theo mentioned those teams that are blessed with experience, guys that have been there, done that, seen this movie before, uh, kind of carry themselves through the beginning of the year that way. Um, the younger, less experienced teams are having a blast just saying, hey, we're in the gym against you know, Theo, against Brad, against Dan. And I think those those are paying off. But I really think that you, you look up and down the top 15 and you can see uh, there's not a whole lot of teams out there that have brand new rosters. And, and I think that in, in our game, it seems like if you're blessed with experience, that that's worth uh, a win or two in January. Yeah. All right. Anyone else want to jump in there? Um, I was just going to mention, like, the, the teams that are undefeated, though, th there is a separation piece there with, like, I mean, Pav's got an older squad, even though he's plugging in a couple of younger pieces, there is an older group with him. Uh, Hawaii's got a returning starting core. Long Beach has got a lot of returners from that group. UCLA's got a lot of returners from that group. Grand Canyon's got a lot of returners from that group. Loyola's got two main pieces that are scoring points for them. Um so we look at some of these teams, and even then we start to say the teams with one loss, you know, Irvine's got, you know, Sonny and Henlow, and Ball State's got Caleb Jennis. And so there's there are some of these core pieces returning. Um, and then you do look at some other teams that are maybe right in that second level, uh, maybe where it's like 10 and below or something like that. I think there's more new pieces on those teams, you know what I mean? So are situations from that. So those guys got maybe some younger groups from that standpoint that, uh, have to kind of learn how to win or kind of figure some of those things out in terms of that. Maybe don't, don't bring back maybe quite as much experience. And it's just great to see that the level of competition where it's at right now. So. Yeah. Yeah. The huge. And we're finding out, you know, we've played 10 matches here in January, which has been a, a gnarly stretch for us and seeing that experience and going up against some of these teams that have those seasoned veterans and guys who have competed at a high level for multiple, multiple years has been a great learning experience for us. I think it's a testament to across the nation, just coaches scheduling and kind of the array of schedule and the variety of schedule that Pab touched on earlier. It There's some variety and randomness and some teams on schedules that we haven't seen in the past. And that's exciting. And that speaks to the growth. And that speaks to, you know, coaches being mindful of making sure we're not just looking out for our schedules and not our plans, but looking out for the other programs coming up and, and building up to make sure that, we're all developing together through this sport. Yeah. And I, I think one, I'm going to add one other maybe underrated factor through January that your experienced teams handle. Forget about the on the court volleyball stuff, but now that there's becoming more and more travel involved and especially the way men's volleyball travels, I think that's another very underrated factor. How do you handle being on the road? You take a group of kids that uh, are making their first road trip anywhere. And all of a sudden, things are different. Things are out of their control. They're not waking up in their own beds. Um, I think we're going to continue to see that be a factor as more and more travel occurs in January. Yeah. 60 or 70 percent of my guys were at the BYU hadn't traveled yet. So that was uh, that was a uh... Brad compliment to you. I, my compliment always comes to coaches who aren't uh, scared to schedule tough. 
You know what I mean? And so I think, you know, Brad's travel and his schedule tough and it's going to make his kids better in the long run. There are, there are sometimes programs will go through this thing where they kind of schedule soft versus difficult. And I think you have to find a balance. We want some challenging matches and then some matches we feel like we have a chance to win. And that's the only way you kind of make your guys better. And you got to do it at home and on the road. So that can always be the challenging part too, in terms of trying to find that balance of the schedule, which pays dividends for your guys and your program. I think one of my favorite things is when you go traveling, especially our trip to Chicago, we had seven, eight guys who hadn't traveled uh, much as a team and kind of sitting back and watching to see what gates they go to and seeing them make wrong turns and follow the other guys and, and go back and forth. And it's, it's really fun. And the, us and the coaches kind of sit back, make sure they don't get too far astray, <laughs> go through the red security gate and, and just kind of enjoying the show. And it's, it's a fun time for sure. Seeing them learn how to travel and kind of look out for themselves. You know, anything to add there? Yeah, I think, you know, these five unbeaten teams in the top 15. Um, so Hawaii, UCLA, Long Beach, Grand Canyon, Loyola. Um, they're kind of the benchmark right now. And I think for all the coaches in, you know, in the country, we're watching some of the things that they're doing and um, trying to figure out how we're going to get our guys to play at that level and compete at that level and, and, and beat those teams. Uh, I, I frankly think that Although those five teams are playing really well right now, there are a, a dozen others that are capable of being right there. And um, I definitely think it's a little too early to tell, right, as far as national champions and, you know, who's going to be playing the best ball at the end. I mean, every single one of our teams is two or three injuries away from it being a completely different roster and, and things being very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot along with, you know, playing great ball and playing it for a long period of time it's who can stay healthy um, and who can sustain it and as we talk about the scheduling stuff you know the scheduling is getting more and more complicated because we have so many different conferences now and most of them starting later right february and, and march and and uh, so now we're kind of pressed to push a ton of matches in the front end and um, like these coaches are talking about a ton of travel and obviously the weather's not always great and there's a lot of things that are complicated with that situation um but I, I anticipate us seeing some other teams uh, definitely challenging this group and and pushing the envelope and, and you know, eventually knocking some of these guys off. Well, see, in, in your guys' discussion, a Pandora's box question like arose in my brain. And I'm like, is it too early to bring up strength of schedule and RPI? But I don't know if I want to do that this early on here. <laughs> Let's, like wait on, let's wait on that one. So. Yeah. <laughs> but I do like seeing the diversity of play of, of all the teams. And that's the thing. It's like, you're, they're getting exposed to different experiences. Like Emmanuel came to UC Irvine for the first time ever. And, you know, just seeing the look on the guy's faces, like, Oh, we've never seen you guys, but you know, we're going to play it out. And the guys had a good time competing. They had a good time coming out um, and just hanging out in the area. So they are talking about their experience of, of being on the road. So you know, and then seeing Hawaii going up in their, their East coast swing. And yeah, I know that they, they're playing not as talented teams, but man, they're, those got other guys on the bench, which is already good and deep are getting even more experience. So when they make that run towards the end, they're going to be scary to play. So, you know, and then seeing Pav coming out to the West coast too, I, I'd make it back to happy Valley, but I got to go make it for a string of matches to make it, you know, beneficial. So oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. <friendly. laughs> And no, San Diego's, that's a tough visit too. And going to the Valley, it's a, you know, it's the traffic that kills me. <laughs> but, you know, what we're talking about with scheduling, I think one of the other things that, that you got to look at is, A, we have one of the longest seasons known to man in collegiate athletics. And I think just because we can schedule every weekend, does it mean we should? I think, like Theo said, we're, we're one injury away from, I think every team is you, you take one key guy out of your lineup and all of a sudden you're trying to figure out how to make up some points somehow. And I think the real key is how do you keep them healthy? And, and maybe that's, Hey, you got to schedule in a weekend where they get, they just get a chance to rest and recuperate then play somebody. Uh, I'm, I've always leaned more toward that end. And it, it, it's interesting to see what happens. Of course, during that weekend, that's usually when my guy goes out and falls out of a tree or something because they, <laughs> they're not in the gym. I think that was that thing, that the topic, uh, Robert, we brought up where we're trying to push, hey, you can't bring your guys back till January 1st. You can't open up the first week until 
you know, Martin Luther King weekend, and then the in-state championships actually gets pushed a week later, yep. uh, which I think what that does is we just bring in these kids back too early and they get a little bit more, and coaches, like, it's like, hey, everybody gets a little bit more family time. And we really don't get ramped up to the beginning of January. And, uh, and then our championships get off the beach weekend, which is good. The beach stuff can be celebrated and ours would be a week later. And so lots of good things come from that. I think if we get our tournament moved forward a little bit and can adjust a little bit somehow. Yeah. Dan Friend is one smart man. <laughs> That's Working why he's got the it, glasses. Yeah. <laughs> All the glasses guys are smart. I'm not saying that you're either smart or good looking and Theo actually has both. So not fair. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, I'm going to jump off of what I'd sent you guys earlier because I wanted to get to some of the top players of the week that you saw, you know, maybe two of them. Um, and it could be offensive, defensive, both offensive, both defensive. But I really felt there's some new names that really rose up in this last week of play. But I'm curious what you guys saw. So um, let's start with uh, you, Theo. Yeah, I think the the top player is, is the one that was in our gym. And Ryan Norris went nine for nine, zero errors. And uh, we tried to stop him and couldn't. Uh, he he was it's probably one of the better matches I've seen him play in his career. Uh, obviously, he's he's somewhat new to the middle position. Um, and I would say that to be honest, he wasn't a huge part of the scouting report, right? Like we had a, we had a sense that he was capable and that he could do some things and he probably played one of his best matches yet and, uh, hit a thousand against us, which is, which is pretty darn good. So, uh, that's my shout out, Ryan Norris. There you go. <laughs> just one for the week, huh? He did enough damage where you just need one. <laughs> that's, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Pav? Well, I, with only having one matchup this week I, I think that you know the long beach guys uh, you gotta you gotta take a look at you mentioned him earlier god bolt um i think there were times where the most crucial times of the match uh clark blocked the ball well took some good swings i think he was good but i, I also like i said flying under the radar right aiden knight just set the middle better than he than i've seen him set the middle and i think if they start to get Aiden moving up even more. And, you know, Andy Reid will, will do that. All of a sudden, that middle third offense, whether it's whether it's the front one or the big series that they run, uh, that's going to give them an, an, an even better weapon. So those those were my two. Yep. Uh, Godwell had 17 kills, four block assists, and Aiden Knight, 38 assists, six digs, solo block, and three block assists. So contributing offensively and defensively. Um, let's go over to you, Brad. Yeah, I mean, I got two. So Jalen Jasper continues to just be on a tear. Um, one night, I think he was over like 550, somewhere in that range um, out in Virginia. And then the other one is Jacob Pastor. Really good two matches, 20 kills, 17 kills in the battles with Princeton. Um, two guys uh, who had really good weeks. All right. And then to Dan. Yeah, I got a couple. I think I mentioned one earlier. Michael De La Cruz for North Greenville beating St. Francis uh, hit 429 um, and then hit 458. Yeah, a couple matches that week. Isaiah failed for Fort Valley State. His overall stat line at the end was 5.63 kills per set while hitting 407, uh, even though they lost uh, in that match. But uh, pretty impressive numbers for him. And then Mick Ramis, those guys rebounded. Uh, I think he ended up, you know, 20 kills hit 324. Do you know what I mean in terms of? Uh, BYU kind of bouncing back uh, against Irvine and be able to get a, a win in five there, which was pretty significant, I think, for those guys and some growth steps for them. So, yeah, Romanus was a steady force, and then he, he it seems like still you know 17 kills night one and still had good numbers and turned it on night two. And you know, they had to pay attention, which opened it up for everyone else. So, uh, great calls, all you guys. Um, how about this? What are you guys watching in week five? And I think it's like a loaded week of matches. So feel free to say whichever ones you want. So um, let's go to Theo. <clears throat> yeah, I think one that I think will be pretty interesting is uh, Ohio State USC. Um, I think obviously both those teams, I think the matchup is going to be pretty unique. Um, and USC is is playing some pretty good ball right now. So I, I think that should be a pretty tough match for Ohio State. And obviously they're coming out. I think they're playing UCLA and USC, right? In that challenge. Yeah. Uh, yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I think those matches will be really good. And then um, Pepperdine uh, faces off with Santa Barbara, uh, which I think that's going to be incredibly exciting. 
Uh, I think both of those teams have some weaknesses, uh, but are also incredibly capable of playing at a high level. And, you know, I think Santa Barbara struggles against really good opposites, as do most of us. And obviously Pepperdine has one of the top ones. And so I think that'll be an exciting match for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's go to Pat. I think the Ball State BYU matchup is going to be interesting. Uh, it'll be, uh, you know, see what uh, see what the Cardinal can do against the Cougar. Uh, there, it, to me, it's it's going to be one of those matches where uh, the the block of BYU and, and the offense of Ball State uh, who's going to who's going to come out? Um, they're all, both going to come out bloodied and battered, I'm sure. But who's going to come out with uh, uh, the best punch from from their strength. Yep. And uh, Dan, what you watching? Well, it took off some good ones I had on my list, but what about the uh, GCU Irvine one? So I think two uh, of them. Two of them. <laughs> uh, so I think you got two programs that are certainly playing a high level. Uh, you could have uh, one of our undefeated teams go down, possibly. You know what I mean? In terms of that, from that standpoint. And so, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, that'd be mine. See, I thought someone would have dropped Loyola Long Beach State because, you know, I know contractually you can't say. I was waiting for Brad. I thought that was Brad. <laughs> I was going to stick with the, the spoiling undefeated. <laughs> but see, Dan's contractually obligated to not say Loyola, so I thought I'd do it for him. <laughs> but yeah, battle of uh, two undefeateds and a uh, Hawks come into an old digs because he was an assistant there. Uh, gosh, it. I, well, I was going to say I'm old, but Pav's on here. Sorry, Pav. You know, we, we got to take just <laughs> each other every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but that'll be a, a good matchup because uh, um, Alan and Hawks used to coach together on the same side. So you know, going head to head, it's a familiar venue for Hawks. They're both undefeated. You got some really good players turning it on in both squads. And, uh, you know, the uh, pyramid's a good rocking place. You know, they, they begin to fill that place. You know, they start getting those natties and the, the crowd's pretty insane there. They got the hot dog in the stands, the living hot dog that's heckling you from the end line. So, Rob, I, I, we play Friday and then we got Saturday, Sunday off. So I'm excited to get to watch some Stanford CSUN. That's going to be a good one <laughs> on Friday night. I, I think CSUN's playing some good ball, you know, and Theo's been doing a good job with them. And, and Stanford, I think, it's going to be a battle. So I'm excited to check that out and see them. And then you got to enjoy Dan Versier. I, I'm excited to see the video <laughs> there and find some things to, to heckle and tease him about. Uh, <laughs> afterwards. Oh, I'm yeah. I think that, that Jay's yeah. not here because of that matchup. He, <laughs> he doesn't want to hear from Dan. He doesn't want to talk to him until that matchup is over. <laughs> if he's not here next week, then we know. <laughs> we know <something> <laughs> Should we send a screen capture the email? I got a lot of stuff. Going on. <laughs> yeah there's six rotations jay we get it yep <laughs> well those are all good picks and i'm looking forward to how the week pans out for not only all our uh, guys that are playing this week but also our coaches on the screen so it's always great to have you special guest mark pavlik and of course a pen